Welcome to the Wounds of the Faithful podcast, brought to you by DSW Ministries. Your host is singer, songwriter, speaker, and domestic violence advocate, Diana Winkler. She is passionate about helping survivors in the church heal from domestic violence and abuse and trauma. This podcast is not a substitute for professional counseling or qualified medical help. Now, here is Diana. Welcome back. I hope that you enjoyed our interview last week. We're continuing on with our series on how to study the Bible. And this is coming from an abuse survivor concept, an abuse survivor perspective. And I feel that this is a very important topic, very important for our healing. I have a great lineup of different folks coming on to the show, folks that some of which have been on our show before, repeat guests, and these are folks that are Bible teachers who love Jesus. Nearly all of them have been abuse survivors. So they know where you're coming from and they are trusted Bible teachers. These are people that I trust that I followed for a long time and can give you clear guidance on, Hey, how do I study the Bible for myself instead of depending on somebody else to spoon feed it to me? We have to know the word ourself. That's an important part of our healing because You and I both know that spiritual abuse is very common in the church. And it's because those people up on the pulpit who are preaching and teaching the Bible, they're getting away with it because we are not keeping them honest. (laughs) We are not in our Bibles. We are not studying the word and checking to make sure that what they're saying is correct. And you say, Diana, isn't it rude to check the pastor or the Sunday school teacher or the guy on the television that's teaching or even a podcast like this one? I listen to a lot of preachers on podcasts. Isn't it rude to check people? No, it's not because it talks about in the scriptures The Bereans, they were a group of people in the church in Paul's day. They searched the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. So even Paul the apostle, his preaching was checked with scripture. They were in there digging to find the truth. Who is this Paul? Who is Peter? What is he preaching? What is he telling us? Does it line up with what we know already about what God has told us up to this point? So anyway, yes, it's important that we check those people that we're listening to. It's really easy just to listen, sit there and veg out, especially Sunday. Sometimes it gets a little, sometimes we get a little comfortable and we don't go home and dig into the word ourselves. I don't want to delay in telling you about my guest today, who is a returning guest. We have Mark Sowers on the podcast today. He is a pastor. He is an abuse survivor. He was on episode 11 last year. He's coming back on the show today. And we're going to talk about Bible study because he has some personal challenges that sometimes can get in the way of learning God's word, but it hasn't let stop him. So let me refresh you on his bio here. For those of you that have not met Mark, but I do recommend that you go back and listen to episode 11 because we're not going to go into 
his story at length today. We want to give Mark as much time as possible to talk about the Bible study aspect. But here is a little bit about Mark. Pastor Mark Sowersby has been married to his wonderful wife, Jennifer, for 17 years and is the father of four children. Mark has been an ordained minister with the Assembly of God Church for over 25 years. Pastor Mark holds a BA in theology from Zion Baptist College, formerly known as North Point Bible College. In 2019, Mark went through a great time of healing. He began speaking about the experiences of his past and God's grace and the transformational work of forgiveness in his life. He now speaks about his story through his ministry, Forgiving the Nightmare. When he isn't serving his congregation and his community through ministry teaching and support, you can find him on all the trails and lakes, spending time with his family. So this is his book, Behind Me, if you're watching on YouTube. Forgiving the Nightmare, and it is a fantastic book. Great story. And you're going to love Pastor Mark, a easygoing, wonderful communicator, and he is really a huge blessing from the Lord. So. Enjoy this conversation with Mark Showersby. I'm so excited to have back on the show, Pastor Mark Showersby. Welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm so blessed to be here. It's good to be back and have an opportunity again to speak to you and to your audience. Such a blessing. Thank you so much. I can't believe it's been a year since you were on the show. That was episode 11. Wow. You, you told your story, and I encourage all of the listeners to go back and listen to that episode of Mark's story. It's amazing. And you didn't even have your book released when you were no, here last time. I did not. And you took a risk in letting this crazy pastor from the Northeast <laughs> come on your show and kind of open up his heart and his mouth. And you trusted me and you trusted the Lord to be able to share a testimony of God's grace and mercy. And since then, we have been able to go out and speak in many places and share the testimony of Forgiving the Nightmare. And we actually, that, the book was released. And here it is right behind me, Forgiving the yep. Nightmare. I've got my copy behind me hey, too, you see. Thank you. See over there. And when I asked you back on the show for this series, I'm like, well, he's all fancy and stuff because he was on the 700 Club. I don't know about any fanciness. <laughs> I'll never forget. I'll tell you the story. I got a call and what they did is they have basically a, an assistant producer call you and they do a, an interview with you. So they never tell you you're going to be on the show. They don't guarantee it. They got to do this pre-interview. And as this woman called me from the 700 Club, I literally thought I was being pranked by my friend. <laughs> uh, they, Hi, I'm calling from CBN. I thought, yeah, right. I could sell you a bridge in New York, too. Thought, really? <laughs> no. But it turned out to be a real call. And about two weeks ago, the episode ran on the 700 Club. It was exciting. Yeah, I watched that. It was pretty neat. And I'm going to put the link in the show notes for the episode. So you were on the 700 Club. Other stuff happened to you this year. Update the listeners on yeah, how you've been you know, doing. Well, basically, we've been sharing the same testimony. Testimony of forgiveness and grace and mercy and love. We've been talking to people about Jesus and how the love of God can help us through those trials and those hurts in our life that they're real and we have to negotiate through them and we don't just come to church and put a plastic smile on and pretend they didn't happen but we go to god and we lay ourselves at the altar and so that's been the message since the beginning that god is great god is big and because we share jesus christ he's opened up some doors mark Batterson, the author of the circle maker got a hold of me he's a new york Times bestseller he read my book and he told me he liked it and he endorsed my book for me so now we're wow. at, like Mark Madison. Yeah, that was exciting. CTN down in Florida had us come in and they had us on a program. We're going to be on another program in a couple of weeks on CTN, Christian Television Network. 
able to go out to North Carolina, spoke at some great treatment centers out there and some wonderful churches. Real hard for me. I had to speak in Myrtle Beach. I had to twist my arm. That was difficult. But, but then we were able to go to Atlanta. We spoke at a program called Atlanta Live, and that was exciting. And a Cornerstone Network has invited us to go on, and we were excited about that. So just a lot of opportunities. They published us in a magazine called Influence Magazine. So God's just given us a, a voice and a platform to be able to share this message. But like I've shared with many, my testimony of the abuse I went through and the journey to forgive those who trespass against me is not my story. Now, I know it's my story. It's my narrative. I'm not a fool. I understand that I'm the one who went through it, but I mean it in a figurative way. It's not my story. The victory in my life is what God's done through me. It's God's story. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I got pulled out of the miry clay. It's only by the love of God. I'm not special. I don't have a special disposition. God's love can pour out to me as he poured out to anyone. And God pulled me out and done a good work in me. So we've been able to lift it up. And say we serve a real God that loves us, who's there for us. So that's kind of where Forgiving the Nightmare is gone. And it's continuing to go. And I got to get back on this awesome podcast. Yeah, I'm so glad that you're back on the show and your enthusiasm is contagious. Your <laughs> excitement for the Lord is catching. And oh, I saw I, on social media this morning, you baptized your girls yesterday. I, I did. And I'll say in my real life, I am not an author. I'm the guy who wrote a book. But in my real life, I'm a pastor. I pastor a church, a real church, blue collar people with a blue collar neighborhood serving a perfect God. And we had a great baptismal service yesterday, the traditional kind, the tank, the pastor, the preacher, the worship team. We baptized a handful of people, but a part of that group was my children. So of course, a proud dad, a proud pastor. My wife and I were in the middle of smiles and tears. I was thinking the next time my daughter comes walking down an aisle in a gown, it might be a whole nother kind of ceremony. Yeah. It was an exciting time for our family and we're blessed. And all three of our daughters went through the water of baptism as a confession of their faith in Jesus Christ. Mm, that is so exciting. Yep. And you have four children, correct? I do. And my son, who just turned 16, the beginning of the end of last year, he, he just got his driver's license and he was <gasps> baptized last year. So now we're in the thick of life. 16-year-old with a driver's license and... He got his first job, and now the girls are growing. Oh, man. Pray for us. Pray yeah. For us. <laughs> the, yeah the people go to my website. They can leave me uh, an email. They go to forgiventhenightmare.com. I need advice, okay? Any parents that are listening, <laughs> that raise teenagers, my wife and I, we need advice. Leave me an email there and say, here's the steps. One, two, three. A friend of mine said, hold on loosely. That's about it. Hold on for the roller coaster, because that's what yeah, it is. Yeah. I remember my dad teaching me how to drive when I was 16 and a stick shift, an escort, I think, and him yelling at me because I went over the lines and stuff. And yeah, I was a pill when I was a teenager. So you're going to need them prayers, brother. <laughs> Amen. Well, we're going to talk about today on our series with Bible study, because a lot of our listeners who have gone through abuse and trauma, a lot of that is spiritual trauma. I have been the recipient of some really bad preaching and really bad teaching. Sure. And a lot of times when we're under the abuse and trauma and we've come out of that, we want to a lot of times throw God out like the baby with the bathwater. Well, I don't want to deal with God. I, I don't want to read his word. I don't want to pray anymore. He wasn't there for me. This is a podcast for those that, okay, yeah, we've been through the abuse, but I don't want to cut God off. I want to understand. Sure. Hey, I want to understand sure. God. I want to get into his word. I don't know how mm -hmm. to study the Bible for myself. I don't Ugh. know how to have a devotional life. I don't Ugh. know all the answers to all the questions that I have, but I want to know the answers to the questions. I want to continue the journey with God, even though I'm not sure where it's going to go or where I am right now. And so that's why we're doing this series. And it's so important. I think you can't really heal 
from abuse without God. I don't believe that you can. I believe that also. God has to be the center of the core, the rock, the foundation. I believe that. There's lots of secular sources out there for healing, but I don't really think that you can fully heal without God because we are a soul. We have a body. And mm. so we're not taking care of our spiritual side. It's an incomplete healing for sure. It definitely has holes. It definitely will have holes. You're right. A lot of my ministry has gathered and been focused on hurting people, hurting places. And some of the churches I've pastored have been hurting churches because of the theology and the teaching that they've been taught. Good people, good intentions, with intelligent minds, capable gifts have been deceived uh, because of some of the poor teaching or the lack of teaching or dis discipleship or even discipline. And it often causes confusion, anger, and frustration. So I definitely understand uh, what that's like to come beside people who wholeheartedly serve God with everything that they were being pointed in a position that would rob from them the joy of their salvation. And I've seen it, and it leaves us many times as a victim. Who do we trust? One of the first casualties in any kind of trauma, my trauma was child abuse, and those that will go back will hear more about it. And the, one of the first casualties in any kind of trauma is just the first thing we lose, right? I don't want to trust anybody. I don't want to trust anyone, anything. I don't want to trust the church. I don't want to trust anything. So trust is one of the first things that it's stolen from us from trauma it's usually the last thing you get back it's the thing that takes the longest to get back and i would say in my journey when i first came to god i was raised in a home full of dysfunction as you can imagine my abuser abused me in every way shape or form but my abuser his language was lies he didn't just tell lies his language his tongue his native tongue was lies, and everything he did was deception. So I grew up in a home that was about lying and deception. So when I came to God, I wanted to know the real God. Now, I didn't know even know which way to look. I was not a strong reader. I graduated high school with third grade reading level. I dyslexic, still am today. So I, I didn't know where to go, but I just started to talk to God. I didn't know if I talked to God right or wrong. I just started to talk to God like I'm talking to you now. I didn't seek forgiveness. I didn't seek gifts. I didn't seek position or power or title. I just wanted God. And I said, God, if you're real, I think we've all said that. God, if you're real, that's the God I want to know. Now, I learned later on, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all this shall be added out to you. I didn't know that then. But by seeking God, God started to help me in my journey. He started to reveal to me his love. He started to reveal to me his truth. And I got confused and I didn't understand. And what does this mean? And why do you say it this way and that way? But I just didn't give up. I just kept seeking. Now there was good days and bad days. One step forward, two steps back. Good weeks and bad weeks, bad months and good months. Of course, I'm human. I had all those expressions. Mm. But I just kept putting God first. What I get questioned a lot is because I call my book Forgiveness. And I can say, by the grace of God, I've forgiven those who have wounded me so. And people say, how did you do it? I didn't start my journey off say, seeking forgiveness. I started my journey off seeking God. God's love and grace and his son, Jesus Christ, brought me through forgiveness. And that's the journey that we all are on. I didn't want something. I wanted God. And in finding God, it gave me everything else, if that makes sense. So yeah, I've seen a lot of abuses and where do we find the truth is only in the Lord, right? The truth sets us free. So I'll say this, I'm a pastor and I've heard it all. And I'll say, I've heard bad theology, bad worship, poor teaching, abusive teaching, manipulative teaching, controlling teaching, and it's horrible. But I like to eat. I don't know about you guys in Arizona, yeah. <laughs> but I like to eat. And I've been to a few bad restaurants. I could tell you some bad restaurant stories. Mm -hmm. I've had poor waitress or waiter. I've had a bad meal. I think I even got food poisoned one time I went to a restaurant. But guess what? I didn't stop going to restaurants. Right? I've been right. to a couple bad ones. I've had some bad meals. I've had some rude service. I've had some dirty places. And when I went, I said, guess what? I'm not going to go back to that one again. Mm -hmm. But I sure do still go to a restaurant. I sure do like taking my wife out for a little candlelight. I sure do like ordering 
tonight, me and my friend Larry, we're going for a big steak. So we're going someplace. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. But I didn't give up going to restaurants because I had a couple bad restaurants. And sometimes we give up on God because we've had some bad teaching. Now that bad teaching needs to be dealt with. It needs to be healed in us. And I understand the psychological and the spiritual battle. But don't give up on God. Because there's some good teaching there, too. There's some good, wholesome, godly preaching. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's a great place to start. I'm glad you mentioned all those things. I'm thankful for the church I'm with now. I have a very healthy church. And they're not perfect, but they love the Lord. And they're trying to teach the word correctly. And it's been a real blessing. Amen. Let's get into the nitty-gritty of it. Sister. Come on, let's um, go. Okay, so when we go to the Christian bookstore, you're on christianbookdistributor.com online, and you're trying to pick out a Bible to read, and you've got all these choices, too many choices, in fact. Where do you start with a Bible? Well, Which one do I pick? Well, I would start from my perspective, okay? Now, when I say my perspective, I am a dyslexic, who graduated high school at a third grade reading level. Mm -hmm. God has not healed me from that. And I still wrestle with reading. I read out of discipline. I rarely read out of enjoyment. So my perspective may be a little different from somebody else's. But from my perspective, what's the one I can understand? What one is my ability going to help me understand what God's saying? That's the first thing. Can I comprehend it? I could buy the most beautiful Bible and read a hundred different versions, but if I can't comprehend it, then what's it mean? That's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is that we have to know the difference between a translation, right? What's a translation of the Bible it, it, and what's a paraphrase? Paraphrase it is somebody has collected the Bible and kind of given it back to us in their own perspective. Which that can be some great things we can glean from that and learn from it. But sometimes there's a difference between what I would call a paraphrased Bible and a translated Bible. So that's the first thing. I think if you're starting off with something that's been translated. Mm -hmm. trans and then you want to go back to a finding a kind of the Bible, a translation that you first can understand. The one that makes sense to you. I guess the ESV, a lot of people love the ESV. Yeah. I'm going to tell you something. Your viewers are going to say, boo. <laughs> I like the NIV. You know, the NIV. And then the NIV purist will ask me what year? 1980 version? 84 version? 86? 91 version? I like the NIV. Uh, King James, if that's you, my mother's generation. My mom, I did not know that she knew the word of God. And while she was passing away, she asked me to go to her room and read the 23rd Psalm. So I did. And I read it from the NIV. And my mom stopped me and she said, Marky, read it right. I said, I am reading it right. She said, no, it says thou. <laughs> it was, so yeah, that's what she was used to. So again, I first, what can be comprehended? That's important. Also make sure it's a translation, not just a paraphrase. Some great paraphrases, but they're not translation. Somebody or some organizations throwing some opinions in. It's okay. Just know it, right? So I'd stay with a solid translation and one you can comprehend. That's great. I laugh when you talk about the NIV because I came from a denomination that was King James only. You know why? That's they... what Jesus spoke. <laughs> yeah, right. And they wore suits and ties too. Yeah, they used to bash the NIV all the time. And until I, I actually read the NIV for myself. I'm like, that's not true. That's not what it says. Because they always said that, oh, that takes out the virgin birth. No, it it doesn't. That's another translation I found out. But but I There's laugh. So at, many of those Bible uh, groups they really try to get into some of the translations, and I don't think. And again, I'm a simple pastor preaching at just a simple church. I am not a Bible scholar. I have my BA, which I'm really happy at. I don't have a hundred masters or doctorate degrees by my name. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that Bible translators are waking up in the morning, waxing their mustaches going, <laughs> <laughs> how can I deceive? Maybe there's a few, but I think earnestly, many of them are trying to 
give a scripture that's full and complete. But I would tell you, I, again, people would say, well, King James says this, and the NIV doesn't have it like that. And, and, and then you go to ESV. If you are a reformist, the ESV is, so there's <laughs> a lot of different translations. And But I guess for me, for my little sliver of the world, for whatever it's worth, buy me a cup of coffee and we'll talk Bible. Yeah, that's a great advice. And we don't have to freak out that if we pick the wrong translation that, that we're terrible Christians or whatever, because some groups, that's how they make you feel. <laughs> they do. They do. I've, I've heard the whole argument of translations. I'm sure some people are loving me and some people want to stone me right now. What do you mean? Period. Oh yeah. I'm probably going to get some send emails. To you. Don't send any to me. <laughs> I'm the host, so yeah, send them to me, y'all. I so. asked for advice, they'll say. <laughs> I asked for advice, they'll say, have your kids read King James only. Yeah, right. So along those lines, do you have to be a Greek scholar or a Hebrew scholar? How does the original languages come into play? Well, obviously there's a role in that, and it's good to know it and be aware of it. But you'll hear people say, God works in mysterious ways. I'm sure we've all heard that phrase. That's not a biblical phrase. It's not in the Bible at all. The closest thing is the Bible says God's ways are higher than our ways. But mm -hmm. no way is God mystical. And God's not trying to hide himself from his people. He's not trying to, to, to jump through hoops and become wordsmiths for us to know him. God wants us to know his word. He wants us to know his love. He wants us to know his son. The word became flesh, John 1, 1. So the word isn't hidden in a mystical, magical kind of way that only a select few with a degree in this and that can decipher it. Now, again, it does enhance. It does help explain there's a role. And yes, when you learn the Greek and the Hebrew and the relationship and how it was all put together and, and how it was presented, that just enha enhances your understanding. But there's been simple guys like me getting saved forever. And you know, they don't know the Greek, the Hebrew, the Latin, the lexicon. They don't know the Texas Receptica. They don't know all that. But what they know is Jesus loves them. So yes, are those tools great? Are they helpful? Should those that teach desire to know those things? Sure, because it helps us to present the gospel in a greater way. But I think the simple word of God that's not simple at all. The word that gives us the conviction and the compassion that calls us to call on his name, the move of the spirit that brings us to a place of confession that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior has never been hidden. It's the simple gospel. So I don't know if that helped, but that's what I think. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of online tools out there that you can look up the original Greek or Hebrew. But there's always that Nimrod that they'll sit there and they'll take some word and some passage in the Bible and they'll have this obscure meaning that they found and changes the entire meaning of the passage. In fact, entire doctrines are made out of some obscure translation of one word in the Aramaic right. or something. And that's the thing with translation. Sometimes in the English language, we translate different than they did in the Greek or the Hebrew, or the Latin, and they can have one word that has different meanings. Like, like we have one word, love. And you know, we say love. I say, I love you to my wife. I say, I love you to my children. I say, I love you to my friends. Well, obviously, we know the simple, that in Greek, there was many different forms of expressions to love. The kind of love that you would use for your wife was a different kind of word. The kind of love you would use for your children is a different kind of Philadelphia, right? Brotherly love, right? So when they're translating, are they translating with the correct word that was applied there? That's where people kind of say, well, it could have been this. And if it was this, therefore it could have been all that. So, and there's a place for that. There's a place to understand that. There's a place to, to study that. In no way am I minimizing that or not making it. There is a place to truly understand good hermeneutics or homiletics. And as we study, we should understand it, but it doesn't make us only a select few. God's word is revealing. It's engaging. It's not exclusive. It's inclusive. Very well said. Now we're sitting down and reading a passage of scripture. What are some basic rules of interpretation that 
you really should have in front of you. Uh, so we are interpreting the, the passage correctly. Well, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, we'll just start with the most simplest of all contents, right? Just like when you buy the house, what's the most important thing about buying a house? Okay, so, right? You could buy a house, you could buy a small house in front of a huge pond. That house is going to be worth a lot of money. Okay, so the same thing about translating. You have to know contents. Understand where the audience that Christ is speaking to, each gospel has a different audience. Each gospel writer is writing to somebody else. So we could spend hours and boy, I'm excited. I could really get into this. We don't have enough time, but really know the audience, know the purpose, know the contents of what he's saying. Why did Christ say this way to this group and say it a different way? He's not contradicting himself. He's presenting it different ways to different groups. So as they said to me in Bible college, always know your audience, always know your audience. Yes, that's important because it drives me nuts when somebody takes a passage of scripture that is for Israel and applies it to the United States when that's not what it says. <laughs> You've probably well, seen the examples. I have seen it when I was in Bible college, the professor said to us, how many believe that God knew them in their mother's womb? And we all raised our hands. And he said, why do you believe that? And we said, because it says in Jeremiah that I knew you in your mother's womb. And the professor said, he told Jeremiah that, not you. Oh. Mm. Wow. Oh. <laughs> so he said, it's not wrong, but now teach me. And sure, he taught us how to interpret. So mm -hmm. do we hold on to promises? Then we can understand them. So he wasn't dismissing that scripture he was teaching us how to interpret and how to have proper hermeneutics and homiletics when it comes to preaching so that's again we want to apply the right scripture to the right situation right paul granger was on last week and he picked on jeremiah 29 11 <laughs> <laughs> it's everybody's favorite verse so. yeah i know some plans he has for me I'm not going to listen to that guy. Come on. I don't like it. I want my scripture. He knows the plans he has for me. Plans to prosper me, right? Of course. Amen. Yeah. I think we, we gathered that it's okay to like that verse and apply it to our life. As long as we understand what the, what the reality of the passage is and where it came from. Yeah. Good interpretation, good content. So let's talk about passages in the Bible that are really difficult one to understand or maybe difficult to swallow. What do you do when you encounter those kind of passages in the scriptures? You want the real answer? I turn yeah. the page and say, God, I can't think about that right now. No. no, when I come to the scripture, I come saying the scripture's correct and I have to be willing to apply myself. So the scripture is the word of God, the logos. Then the word became flesh. Now, yes, there has to be proper interpretation. There's cultural interpretation. There's all kinds of forms in where the Bible is applied in the contents that it's spoken. So I'm not, I'm not saying you just use one ruler to measure the whole thing because there's poetry in the Bible, there's narrative in the Bible. There's all forms of literature discipline happening in those 66 books, and you have to measure it or apply it within its own contents, if you would. But when I go to that, basically, I realize I have to apply myself to the word of God. I'm not going to change the word of God. The word of God is there to change me. Now, it doesn't make me ignorant or a robot. It doesn't tell me to shut off my brain. It doesn't tell me to stop thinking. <laughs> the Bible says, come let us reason together, forever studying, but never learning. But you know what? At the end of the day, those hard scriptures that I don't like, because they kind of, yeah. they don't feel good. I don't want to talk about them. At the end of the day, if it's God's word, it has to trump Mark's likes or dislikes. Yeah, I get all the time. Well, what about Noah and, and the flood? What about Abraham sacrificing his son Isaac? And God's a horrible God. And I said, well, if you study Abraham's life or the scriptures, or you study Noah and his life and the scriptures in the Old Testament, 
God is not just a God of wrath. He's a God of love. If yes. you're just looking for it, you can see that. God yes. is love, mercy, and forgiveness. You're just looking at one part. And they're hard parts. But to think as a parent that God would say, put your baby on an altar. But didn't God the Father put his son on an altar? Yes, he did. Didn't, didn't God the Father watch his son die? So there's a lot of reasons why these things happen. He called Abraham a friend of God. So I don't understand. I won't try to give an answer. I'm sure whatever answer would never be good enough. But all I would say is that I don't know God's ways. His ways are higher than my ways. They're not mysterious, but they're higher. They're greater. And God works in ways that will always glorify himself. And so when he asked those servants to do those incredible things. Now, here's the good thing, right? God provided a sacrifice. Yes. So even though that Abraham brought his son on top of that mountain, even though he raised that, that knife, if you would, God said no, and he offered a ram in the thicket. And even though Jonah fell into the water and got swallowed by the fish, whale, fish, we'll get into that. Oh, come on. At the end of the day, the greatest revival in all the Old Testament took place. That when Jonah came upon the land of Nineveh, he told them to repent. And the Bible says, even the animals. So the greatest revival in all of the Old Testament, we don't read it from that perspective because we read it from Jonah's perspective going, hey, this is no good. But when Jonah landed on Nineveh, the greatest revival in all of the New Testament took place. So God has a plan and I can't pretend to be God. Yes. I tell people I'm in middle management. I'm in middle management. <laughs> funny yeah we just have to trust the lord and seek the answers because he'll tell you he will tell you if you're seeking the answers but some things we're not going to know this side of eternity hebrews chapter 11 those that were commended for their faith there's always a faith aspect and I, sometimes we don't want that no i want black and white left and right up and down one and one equals two i want to know that i know that i know that i know and as soon as you sprinkle faith in that with the gospel and the word of god in following the lord no matter how you express that that worship if it's more conservative or lofty or charismatic no matter how you express it there's always a measure of faith mm -hmm. there's always a measure of faith and boy that can be challenging to say i'm a grown man and i believe somebody got swallowed by a fish i'm a grown man and i believe somebody walked on the water i'm a grown man and i believe somebody raised from the dead i'm a grown man and i believe god could feed the five thousand i'm a grown man and i believe i'll be in heaven someday and all those beliefs are built not just by our own intellect it's built by the faith that God's put inside us all. Amen. Amen. You know, we already talked about false teachers and bad teachers. What is a way that we can recognize if we're under a false teacher or somebody that we need to run the other way because this teacher is sure. uh, going down the well, wrong path? The best way to recognize a counterfeit is to know the original. That's the best way to know a counterfeit, right? So I've heard, and I've only read this, or heard stories about it, that those who search after counterfeit money, they spend all their days studying the original so they can quickly recognize a counterfeit. The Secret Service, they have a whole department of people who study money, the $20, the $50, the $1, and they know the original so well that when they see a counterfeit, they can pick it out a mile away. And I would say that's still the same for us. Let us know the original so well. Know the love of God, know the grace of God, know the word of God, know the volume, know the spirit, know how it reflects and moves and reacts. Not that it's always the same all the time, but the more we know God, the more we can recognize the anti. See, Jesus is called the Christ because it means anointed one, right? That's not his last name. It wasn't Jesus Christ. Christ is his title. It says, Jesus Christ, Jesus, the anointed one. And then he tells us later, be careful of antichrist, anti-anointed one. 
And how do we recognize the Antichrist, small Antichrist or big Antichrist or the Antichrist, or however you want to define that, but how do you recognize that? By recognizing the original. The more we know the Christ, the more we'll recognize the Antichrist. Yeah, some definitely believe some heretical teachings, and I'm not sure how they came to those conclusions. I knew that they were heretical teachings because I had studied the Bible for so long. That's not how God works, or that's not what that verse means. Sure, a lot of us like our Christianity a la carte. Right? We want to pick and choose. Like when you at the restaurant again and they come by with mm -hmm. dessert at the end. It's called a la carte. They have all kinds of desserts on it and you can pick one or two. It could be <laughs> ice cream or cookies. Well, a lot of people like that, they're Christianity. And they want Christianity a la carte. I want a whole lot of great, but I don't want to, I don't want to eat too much sacrifice. I want a whole lot of love, but I don't want to give a whole lot of discipline. So we want Christianity a la carte. I remember when being in the ministry, I had a guy come up to me and go, I believe in about eight of the 10 commandments. I'm like, well, they're non-negotiable. They're not like we get to pick and choose. They're the 10 commandments for a reason. Yeah, but eight of them, I'm pretty solid. These other two, I don't know if I agree with. And I can imagine that there's a lot of people that come, I like four, the other six, I'll throw them away. Or, hey, I'm good with three of them. So a lot of people do that. Many people walk around with a Christianity that's behind glass. It's break in case of emergency. I remember one day I watched, it was a snowstorm here in New England. I know you in Arizona people don't know about that, but we had about a foot of snow down. The plow just went down the street and I looked out my window, it was freezing, it was below zero. And there was this young lady running down the street in a jogging outfit. And you know what I thought to myself? This is not her first day running. Nobody would have woken up that day and said, hey, you know what I want to start today? It was a part of her life. It was a habit. It was who she was. Running was a part of her. So even though the storm was bad and it was cold outside, within her, she had to run. A lot of us, we just break out our Christianity in the midst of the problem. You know, well, oh, somebody's sick or I got fired. And God meets us in those places. I'm not making that small. But when we're walking with God all the time, when the storms come, we're still putting on our cloak of praise. We're still putting on that garment and worshiping. So when the pink slip shows up, even though it hurts and even though it's hard and even though we weep, we go, I got a faith that's going to hold me up. Even though when the doctor gives the x-ray and it hurts and we're crying, how? But I got a faith that's going to hold me up. Even when there's trouble and strife and there's issues, we got a faith that holds us up. So it's going to happen. Problems are going to come in this world. You'll have many troubles. Fear not, Jesus said, because I'm with you always. Mm, amen. Such great truth. I'm going to have a lot of guests on the show that have different denominations, maybe some different beliefs as far as uh, Christian doctrine. Like, for example, uh, the end times. I'm a pre-millennialist, uh, pre-tribulation. Uh, I believe in the rapture, but I have friends and family members that don't believe in the rapture or they believe uh, different for the end sure. times. What's the difference between, this is a variation on a basic Christian doctrines with a little bit of, a little bit of leeway without it being, like we say, heretical teaching. Does that make any uh, sense? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Boy, you're making me put on my, my theology cap here today. You're bringing me back to college, <laughs> which is great. I guess I'll just, again, talk from my perspective. What does it profit a man? Would it inherit the whole world that loses eternal soul? Those are important questions and how we interpret those questions or how we're going to express our faith and what we're prepared for and how we live. So again, I'm not undermining those questions. They're important but there is so many variations and so many variables. And there's, again, these things are going to be discussed from now until Christ comes home. Either the trouble will blow or be raptured or will be put in the grave and the dead in Christ shall rise. Right. But it, it's going to happen one way. What we need to focus on is the gospel. Mm -hmm. The gospel. You can be a staunch reformist, a 5.2 <laughs> Baptist. You can be an evangelical Cal Arminian. But if you let us preach 
Jesus Christ crucified is the message that we've been called to preach. Go and sin no more. Turn and repent and come to your Savior. Now you may say, I recognize my election, or you may say, I ask Christ into my life. However you express that, may Christ be your God. You know, a friend of mine, he is a good guy. I love him with all my heart. He's a reformed preacher. And I am an Assembly of God preacher. So you can imagine our conversations. <laughs> a lot of love, a lot of friendship. And every time I was in the room with him, I would say, I know, brother, I didn't ask Jesus Christ in my life. I recognize the election that I received from God. And so, but you know what? God saved me. He saved me either by election or by confession. He saved me by grace. He saved me by the grace of his son that went to the cross to pay the price for my sin to set me free. And guess what? There's going to be a million more books. There's going to be a million more preaching. But when Christ is not in the center, when Christ is not being lifted up, when man's doctrine becomes louder than God's word is a big red flag to any denomination that God must be the center and we lift God up and we lift up the gospel and we make room for all to come to the kingdom of God because Christ. Well, you did a really great job answering that question, Mark. Yeah, a lot of people are like, what's a tulip? Y'all can Google all that stuff. All those big words that we just mentioned, uh, people are like. Uh, they can't be that big because I understand it. <laughs> believe me. But uh, that's exactly the answer that I gave to one of my relatives. I was discussing some really complicated doctrinal stuff, which we disagreed on. And I said that very thing. I said, you know what? What's important is our salvation and loving others as Christ loved the church. Loving your neighbor and obeying what we do know, obeying the commandments and our quiet time with the Lord, our prayer, communicating with God, all this other stuff over here, well, nobody you know, one cares. Of my, one of my favorite stories, I will put it that way in the Bible, is about the man that was blind and got healed. Jesus heals him from being blind in a miraculous, a miracle way that happened with the splendor of God's miraculously mercy. And they drag him in before the Sanhedrin, before the, the, the leading groups, and they start grilling him. All these theological terms like we're talking now. What did he say? What did he do? What did he mean? Where did he go? What's he confessing? What? How did he heal you? And the blind man goes, listen, guys, listen, I don't know really anything you guys are talking about. I don't know all these theological terms. I don't know if I'm talking to Pharisees or Sadducees. Am I talking to the Hedron? I don't know what you guys are talking about. All I know, Jack, is I was blind and now I can see. And I think that sometimes you and I have these great conversations and I love them. I love to have this and chew on that, talk about Reformed theology and, and evangelical theology and, and a Calvinist and an Arminian and, and all the different facets of that. There's a fun place for that and we can discuss it. But at the end of the day, I was lost, but now I'm saved. Amen, bro. How'd that happen? Jesus Christ died. For me. Well, are you called or are you elected? Did you confess? <laughs> Or did you proclaim? All I know, man, is this broken kid that grew up in abuse, that was under a heavy hand, that hated himself for a long time, that couldn't get out of his own way, and was wrestling with insecurity and fear for most of his life, that when Jesus impacted my life, I've been changed and made new. How did it happen? Jesus Christ. That's all I know. That's, that's right. We got all the hard questions out of the way. As a pastor, what resources do you like to use in your Bible study? What tools do you use? Well, there's a lot of good things written about the Bible, uh, but really I try to stay in the Word. I try to say, now again, I, I, I try to get all those things we talked about. I try to find out culturally. I try to talk about the audience. I try to give the historical aspect. I, I look at those things, all those commentaries. But at the end of the day, there's always somebody else's opinion. They're great opinions. Some of them are dead on. I'm not saying they're wrong opinions. And we have to pray and say, but Lord, is this where you're leading me? Is this where you're leading our church? Is this where you're speaking to us? 
Is this what your word says? Am I trying to fit a square peg into a round hole? Is this what I want it to say? Or is this what it says? God, I don't want to preach that hard word because people won't love me. But if that's what your word says, I have to preach a full gospel. So there's a lot of me in it. There's a lot of God in it. But you know, at the end of the day, I use a lot of different resources. I remember going to a seminar one day and they asked, who do you use? And I raised my hand. I was like, the Bible? Uh, <laughs> the Bible. So yeah, it's maybe because I'm not a strong reader. Again, I told you reading for me is a discipline, not a joy. So I've kind of been forced to put myself in this view and that, and I'm sticking to it, I guess. <laughs> well, I say that because when in my previous churches, fundamental Baptist churches, we were never allowed to have a Bible that had footnotes in it. We were not allowed to use commentaries. And the only thing that we were really allowed to have was a Thompson Sheen with the references to other verses. And I think that handicapped me quite a bit because I lost out on a lot of stuff I'm discovering now, the cultural stuff, geography, and um, the Hebrew. The Bible was written from a Hebrew point of view, not from an American view. That's right. It's and a Eastern thinking book. It was not written with a Western thinking book. No, it wasn't. Concept. Well, I shouldn't say missed out. I did learn a lot with just reading the Bible, but I think I struggled quite a bit. When you read outside information, outside commentaries, you have to chew up the meat and spit out the bones. Not everybody and everything you read from everyone, except in forgiving the nightmare. No, I was everything you read. <laughs> that you're going to agree with, right? There could be a real great point the author is making on page one, but on page two, you're thinking, what were you thinking? So, but we study, we read it, we're able to apply it, we pray on it, and then we go in, and again, this disciplines to preaching, again, anybody that listens today that are in the ministry would know those terms, hermeneutics and homiletics and interpretation in Greek and Hebrew, and all those things are very important, and no way am I undermining those things are very important that the people that are gifts to the body that can bring that that deeper understanding if you would or interpretation but god is not a mystery he wants to be found his love is abundant his grace is fresh and new every day and yes yeah, so i've read some people that i've loved page three and six and nine and ten but the other pages i'm like <laughs> no uh -uh. <laughs> Ask me, most days I'm definitely a 3.2 of most days. Some days I'm a 4.2 of guy, That's how I'm but I'm never a 5.2 of guy. I'll let you figure out the fifth point later on, but I'm always the 3.2 of some days a fourth point, but never a fifth point. So, so yeah, I appreciate you answering that. It sounds like the way that you approach Bible study is don't sweat the small stuff. Oh. Oh, that's going to take care of itself. And if we're seeking the Lord, he's going to show himself to you. If you're in the word, trying to understand and seek so the truth. You're right. That's the million mile. That's the high thousand mile, hundred mile away view. But at the same time, as a pastor, you do have to watch the margins because there can be some crazy theology that's built in the margins. So yes, ultimately, like you said, I have the hundred mile view and God, you know, going to focus on the big things and God's going to figure out all the rest. That's probably where I like to live. But at the same time, I'm not so ignorant to say I'm going to ignore the edges because again, weird theology. I've heard people read the Bible and the Bible says, and you'll do greater things than Christ. So you'll do greater things than me. And they'll literally close the book and go, I could do greater things than God. And then we all know we have narcissistic friends, right? Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, yeah. So there are important truths on the margins. There's important truths on the mile view. So it's important. And I understand a shepherd, a pastor is to protect. It's one of the jobs of a shepherd. When David refers to God as a shepherd, he refers to God with two tools, a staff and a rod. And the rod is to beat off the, the foxes and the wolves. And the staff is to pull them on, out of the way. And every shepherd should be carrying a staff and a rod. And we should use the rod to beat off the wolves. And some of that poor theology, we need to watch out. So yeah, ultimately, 
a million mile view, the hundred mile view. But at the same time, let us not be ignorant and let small little things pop up that build greater confusion for the body. God's not a God of confusion. So when confusion takes place, that's not of God. Oh, that's a very good point. Yes. Yeah. I know we talked about a lot of things today. I threw a bunch of stuff at you and you just hit them out of the park as uh -huh. I expected. And is there anything uh, else about Bible study that we didn't talk about that you wanted to mention? Well, I tell people all the time that when we start walking with God, we're on a journey. If we really want more of God, then we have to be really ready to, for that. And on that journey, we're going to find different crossroads, if you would. And that first crossroad we're going to come to is going to be sacrifice. Are we going to really sacrifice our heart, our time? Then the next crossroad we're going to come to is submission. And boy, that's hard, right? I'm going to submit myself. And then another crossroad we're going to come to is confidence. We're going to know that God can do what he says he's going to do. And then another crossroad we're going to come to is humility. Because we know God can, and we're going to claim it and proclaim it and say, I know my God can. And God's going to say, hey, but I'm going to do it in my time and in my way, not your way. So, you know, when you're walking with God, know the love of God has saved you. And then you're growing to be that disciple. Let God can transform you and make you. He is the potter and we are the clay. And let the word of God give you the peace for it is still the light to the world. It's still the answer to the world. And it's still the hope of my spirit for it's the rock I build my house on. And it's still the sword in my hand that helps me fight off the enemy. So I hope I shared a little bit today. Amen. This was fantastic. Enjoyed hearing your responses and your wisdom. So tell the folks how they can get in touch with you and get your book. Well, a couple of different things about me. Again, my pastor in Massachusetts. So we say wicked awesome. And well, how you <laughs> talk the cod, how the yacht. That's how we talk, right? Go socks. So the Celtics <laughs> broke my heart this year. So we're in Massachusetts. And you can find me at our church at Calvary Community Church at Dudley, Mass. You can go there. Or you can find me at my website for my ministry called forgivingthenightmare.com. We got a book. You heard us talk a little bit about it today, about learning to forgive and the process and the genuality of the journey and trusting God. If you want to know more about the book or check it out, go on Amazon. You can buy the book on Amazon, Forgiving the Nightmare. And then we're also on all the social media. We're on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. So check us out, forgivingthenightmare.com. <laughs> all right awesome and mark thanks so much for coming on the show and i definitely have the uh, the phileo love for you brother oh thank you sis. brotherly love there you're always welcome to come back on the show anytime and i just want to say congratulations 100 episodes and that is a milestone you have been faithful to your podcast to your audience and lifting up the name of jesus so I'm going to celebrate a little with you. So God bless you. And thank you for letting me be a part. Amen. Now, if I could ask you to say a prayer for our listeners in their journey to Bible study. Father God, we love you so much. And we thank you that you're not hidden from us. That Father, you desire to reveal your word, your grace, your mercy to us, Lord God. So Father, I pray as we study, we will find you. As we knock on that door, it'll be open to us. As we ask, we shall receive, Lord. And I pray for those that have been wounded by poor teaching and theology, manipulative spirits, Lord God, that, Father, they may know that they could trust you. They could run into those big arms of Jesus. They could put their head upon your chest. And may they hear as John heard, Lord God, as Peter heard, do you love me? Lord, may they hear that today. So I pray, Lord, you bless us, be with us as we trust in the name above all names, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Wounds of the Faithful podcast. If this episode has been helpful to you, please hit the subscribe button and tell a friend. You can connect with us at dswministries.org where you'll find our blog along with our Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel links. Hope to see you next week.